Two weeks ago, I was in Israel. And this message begins at a ruined synagogue, first century synagogue, one of seven that survived from Jesus' time, one of seven in all the world that survived. This one is beautifully situated on the shoulder of the Arbel Pass. It's a cut. It's a cut in the mountains. You can see behind me, it's a cut in the mountains where you look through and you see the northern tip of what we know as the Sea of Ga the Lake of Galilee or the Sea of Galilee. It is in that transit place, if you are traveling from Nazareth into Galilee, you have to go through there. If you're traveling from Samaria, you have to go through there. If you're traveling from, from Tyre and Sidon, Phoenicia, you're going to go through there. It is the natural cut, it's the traffic way that leads you into the Galilee. And this, especially this northern region of Galilee, where most of Jesus' gospels ministry takes place, he's up in the northern sector where you have Capernaum and Chorazin and Bethsaida and Magdala. You have all of these towns, and they're grouped really close together. And much of what Jesus did was either based there or it happened there. And this ancient synagogue sits up on the hill on the pass that takes you into that to that region. And for those of you who couldn't or may not be able to make it out because of the photo, if you can see the pointer, this is the Sea of Galilee right down in here. Can you see it? Can you trust me that it's there? It was the last time I looked. Yes, indeed. Sea of Galilee. So we're right up above Galilee. Jesus always passed this way to gain access into the Galilean region. Nazareth is right over here. If you look at the left corner of the screens, Nazareth is right over in this area. And so Jesus, moving from Nazareth to Capernaum, which is up in this area, comes through this pass, always. And this little star right here, this is our bell. It's our bell. This is where the synagogue, and so the pictures you saw a moment ago, this puts you right in the midst of all of this. Approaching the pass... This two-story synagogue dominated the hillside to the south. And even today, tourists can walk along a pathway from ancient Nazareth all the way, all the way down to the Galilee by walking through this path. While we were at the Arbel, there were people who came through with backpacks on, and that's what they were doing. They were hiking the trail, and they were walking in the steps of Jesus because there is absolutely no way that he did not come this way and pass by here we also know that Jesus taught here and ministered here. Just moments before I snapped this picture, we had been enjoying great teaching as Dr. Nunnally stood in the place of the rabbi and connected the scripture to the land and the land to the storyline and to the miracles. And we closed with a time of silence. Dr. Nunnally said, we just want to be quiet out here in this place. Spread out, he said, and people spread out all over the ruins. Spread out, and he said, we're just going to give some quiet time, and when you're done, just head for the bus, which was over the next hill. But he said, just be silent and listen for God and worship the Lord and give him thanks. And the place fell quiet, and the group that had been hiking got on down the pathway and were out of the way, and it was, it was silence and just the wind. And I closed my eyes and people around, it was so fabulous to watch people around me just stand in that place and lift their hands silently to the heavens and worship the Lord. It was, well, it, it just almost made the hair stand up on the back of your neck. It was so awesome. And I waited just a little while longer. I waited till everybody had moved, had moved away and we were headed for the bus because I wanted this moment, I wanted this picture, I wanted this memory. Because in the silence, I heard a sacred rhythm. I heard it like I have never heard it before. I picked up on something that I know is lost in our time. But more about sacred rhythms, more about that in a moment. In the quiet of our bell, I felt as much as I heard the scripture. And Jesus went throughout all their cities and villages, 
teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. Matthew is speaking of these Galilean cities and this Galilean circuit where Jesus ministered. And it was as though Matthew called my name in that moment and said, hey, hey, Jesus taught right there. And Jesus healed disease right there. And Jesus preached the kingdom of God right there. And indeed he did. The witnesses, the witnesses confirmed throughout the Gospels, it's very clear that he preached in the synagogue in Capernaum, in Chorazin, in Magdala, in Bethsaida, in all of the villages that he taught. He could not have missed this one. He would almost trip over it on his way into the Galilee. And it was an impressive building, two stories tall, looking down over the hillside, a landmark Jesus saw every time he made his transit from Nazareth to Samaria. Think for a moment, with the exception of a few times when Jesus went south out of Galilee, most of the time when Jesus was going anywhere, he passed through the Arbel Pass and through, at times, Samaria and towards Nazareth, Jesus walked here. Jesus spoke here. Jesus taught here. Jesus healed here in the synagogue on the Sabbath. And it was in that synagogue I heard a sacred rhythm. But more about sacred rhythm in a moment. Do you understand the concept of rhythm? Ben, I need your help. Come help me. Do you understand the concept of rhythm? How many of you feel like you've got rhythm? How many of you admit that you don't? Okay. All right. This might be a little bit rough this morning, but we're going to give it a try. We're gonna, I want you to understand just the whole idea of sacred rhythm. So you have to understand rhythm to begin with. So I'm going to have Ben just give me a straight four, a rock and roll four, with, and just give us a, something that we could dance to, or we'll clap. We're allowed to do that. So just something that we can, and I just want us to feel rhythm. So just give us a straight four, Ben, would you? Let's pick it up. Pick the tempo up. Are you feeling it? Are you feeling it? Okay, well then clap, okay? Okay, now this is, this is interesting. White people always clap on one and three, and people with soul clap on two and four. And so we always have these confusing moments when we try and do anything as a church rhythmically. Because you've got people who clap on the one and the three, and then, do you understand what I'm saying? So let's see if we can get it. So you clap with me because I want you to feel the rhythm. Otherwise, my whole sermon is buster and we might as well go to lunch. So try that and a little pick up the tempo just a bit, Ben. Give us a little more four. Yeah, four. Oh, yeah. Now you feel it, don't you? We will, we will. You were there, weren't you? Mm hmm. Okay, just let's get a different flavor for it. Let's go to, we'll go to a waltz, just a three, four waltz. Remember the one, two, three, one, two, three. Somebody tried to teach you to dance to this. So just so that you feel it, okay? Go ahead. White people are really good at this. Okay, that's the waltz, or it's the um pa pa, depending on whether you're German or not. Um, and then let's go to cut time. Let's just go to a 2-4. We'll go to a march, kind of a military march. And I want you all to stand up with me. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Come on, everybody marches. If you don't march, you cannot go to lunch. Okay, everybody can march. Everybody feel it. Man, some of you are swinging your arms like you're really something else. It's great. Yeah, you feel it? You feel it? Okay. All right. Now stay standing. Stay standing because you're all going to dance here in a moment. Hold on. I've asked Ben to do something that is impossible for most drummers. They have to work at it. As a matter of fact, he had to practice to do this. I have asked him to drum for a moment with no rhythm so you can understand the difference between rhythm or the lack of it. So Ben's going to give us a sample of drumming without rhythm and see if you can pick up the groove. Okay, here we go.
Thank you, Ben Jones. Will you give it up for Ben Jones? Mm -hmm. And you may be seated. You see, you have rhythm and it has purpose, but when you don't have rhythm, you have nothing but noise and you cannot dance to noise. You can't, are you listening to me this morning? You cannot dance to noise. You need rhythm. And when we ignore the rhythms that God has set in place, life just won't dance. And some of you are looking for a life that dances, a life that moves, a life that flows, a life that's smooth. You're looking for a life that just flows. You're looking for that. You're longing for that. And you can never find it, and you never will, until you establish in your life sacred rhythms. And there's a bunch of them. We're going to just touch on some of it today. But sacred rhythms that set these things in order in your life where God can begin to move you with the tempo of his will in your life. And you can begin to dance with him and feel the pleasure of life that falls into place. You see, all of God's creative impulse is rhythm. I read, I was thinking about these things, praying about these things, and I read Genesis 1. Something clicked in my mind, so I flipped over to Genesis 1, and I started to read Genesis 1 looking, looking for one thing, looking for rhythm. And wow, all of a sudden Genesis came alive in a way that it never has for me. Just this last week, a new revelation, Genesis is all about rhythm. It's there from the very beginning. If you'll read Genesis 1, you'll see the connection of the elements in a ceaseless rhythm of seasons, days, nights, planting, harvest, orbits, stars, gravities, tides rising and falling, currents moving, all of it by a preordained rhythm. In the beginning, God said, let there be light and the light was separated from darkness and therefore God created the first interval between day and night. It is an orderly pattern that God has set in order and the days are for work and leisure and the nights are for rest and sleep and God put it in that order and if we follow in that order we get the benefit from it but when we violate it we get, oh I'm so tired. Oh why are you tired? Well I just don't sleep. Oh, why don't you go to sleep at night? Well, I don't know. We stay up too late. We've got all kinds of artificial light. It affects our sleep patterns. We live, basically, this culture lives in complete violation of this order that God has set. There's a sacred rhythm in the day and the night. And you see God, you see God creating the day and the night, and he's setting that in rhythm. Wouldn't you say that that's a pretty steady rhythm? Hasn't it flown, except for the time when God caused the sun to stand still, hasn't that rhythm continued from the first day even until now? How many of you, how many of you have confidence that the sun will come up tomorrow? You do? Why? Because it always has, because we know this is part of God's rhythm. And then it was the creation of the seas, and the seas are teeming with life, with schools and migrations of fish that are following preset rhythms in currents. Sailors go out and they sail the currents, and the current that they sail today, they know it's going to be there because it always is this time of the year. But three months from now, they'll go out and they'll try and sail that same current, and it's not there because it's moved to another place as it does. And the seas, the oceans, everything that's happening in the oceans, all of it is moving in orchestration because God has breathed rhythm into it. It's magnificent. Well, and then he created the land. He created the land for planting and seed and bringing forth fruit in season. It's a cycle, and there's a rhythm in all of this. How many of you are hearing a Disney song right now? The circle of life. Well, Disney got the idea from God, who set everything in its rhythm from the very, from the very beginning. All of Genesis translates from the voice of God, the word of God, into a sacred rhythm. Oh, and we're not done yet. Then we've got to look up in the skies at night and we see the stars locked in the rhythm of their orbit. Some appear every calendar year. Some, like the comets, come on the scene every 84 years or 93 years or 112 years. 
And isn't it interesting that the ancients who watched the heavens and recorded these things could pick up on a sacred rhythm 83 years after it had come before. They looked at the writings and they said, there it is. And 83 years later, there it is. 83 years later, there it is. And then people were looking to the sky saying, any day now, why? Because God set this sacred rhythm in all of the universe. Listen, everything in the universe bows to his name. Everything in the universe is rotating according to his plan. And even the universe is expanding. There's a rhythm in all of that, and it's all by God's, it's all by God's hand. And then the moon and the stars bringing a gravitational pull on the earth, creating tides. Sherry and I sailed on the biggest cruise ship in the world last year. We loved it. We had such a great time. That thing has so much technology on it. It is man's ingenuity. It is his victory over the ocean. Interesting, isn't it, that the ocean possesses the power to crush it at any time. But we're sailing this magnificent cruise ship, and we thought it was wonderful. Found out in navigation, those guys with everything that they have, everything that they have at their fingertips, have to take into account the tides. It doesn't matter what you're sailing, you've got to know the tides. And the tides are set by the, by the gravitational pull of the moon, and all of this was set in order. God said they're going to need one moon because of <laughs> one moon. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Every family needs one moon. Anyways... They're going, they're going to need, uh, I'm over the moon, and, and no, they, they're going to need one, they're going to need one moon because of the rhythm that I've set for the earth, not four, not five moons, one moon, it'll set the tides perfectly for the divine order that I've set in place, and so there's a sacred rhythm, there's a sacred rhythm with the orbit of the moon and the pull on the earth, and wow. And the earth is rotating. The earth is rotating every 24 hours and moving in an orbit around the sun marked in 365, 365 days and a quarter day. That has to be accounted for with our leap year. All of these things are happening in perfect order according to God's created rhythm. Oh, and, and in the scripture it talks about the birds and the beasts and it talks about the swarms. And the swarms and the birds and the beasts, they are all locked into light and season and ritual and breeding, migration, molting, morphing, all of it in an unceasing rhythm, a sacred rhythm. Well, we don't even have to look at all of creation. Man is held captive to all of these natural rhythms, but he's also prescribed a certain rhythm. There it is. This rhythm has to just keep, it has to keep sounding. Your heart has to keep pounding or else would you agree you're in terrible trouble? If we fall out of rhythm, we develop an irregular heartbeat. We're in danger of all manner of cardiac distress. We go into atrial fibrillation, AFib, and we lose the beat altogether. And when the rhythm dies, we die. When the rhythm dies, we die. Do you understand that everything that God created, he set in a sacred rhythm? Everything. It's a magnificent truth. And that's what captured me at the synagogue at Arbel. The fact that God established a sacred rhythm that touches everything that touches me. Nothing speaks of God's sacred rhythm like the Sabbath. The Sabbath. One day of seven that is set aside for God. For Jesus, it was the Sabbath and the synagogue, one day in seven, set aside for God and rest, a God-prescribed remedy for life. We don't do church on Sunday to get your tithe and offering. You've already proved about 20% of you now, just you send it through electronically. Bless you. We're glad you do. But you don't have to come and give on a Sunday morning. You can do that a lot of different ways. No, most of us understand that there's something, although we've forgotten really what it is at times and we're not connected to it as we should be, there's something about a sacred rhythm in the gathering together on a Sabbath that is biblical and it's necessary for our spiritual health. That's where you amen. 
It's necessary for our spiritual health. It's designed by God, and he prescribed it for us, but we have abused the prescription. We have utterly failed to preserve the spirit of the Sabbath. We have lost the beat. We have, we have dropped the sacred rhythm, and we suffer for it. The church today has heart disease. We suffer from a spiritual AFib, irregular heartbeat, because we have discounted the necessity of sacred rhythms and especially the celebration of the Sabbath. Do we know better? Are we smarter now than they were before us? I think not. It is the greatest foolishness and arrogance a generation can know for them to think that in their modernity or in their ingenuity they can hold in suspension what God has placed in divine order. If you think you can suspend what God has set as part of his divine order, I've got news for you. I've got news for you. It will never happen. His word will endure forevermore. You will break yourself, but you will not break. The law will stand. The law will stand. What God has set in place, it stands forever. And we have to honor it and respect it. It's only as we honor it and respect it and listen for it and flow with it that we can learn in life to dance rather than stumble and fall and trip. That our lives can take on order rather than that mess you heard a moment ago all over the map. What do we look like in our Christian walk in the culture? Is there a groove? Or is it just a bunch of noise? I'm afraid the world looks at the way we are portrayed on television. The world looks at the way that we sometimes portray ourselves. God help us. And what they see is a mess that makes no sense whatsoever. When they should hear the music, they should feel the rhythm. God has set rhythms in order. And when I speak of the Sabbath, I'm talking about an absolute baseline that God has established, and he has never de-emphasized it. He has never set it apart. The Sabbath matters to God. And please, vanish all thoughts that I am advocating some new kind of legalism, telling people they're going to hell if they're not here 50 Sundays out of 52, because I don't know where we... Any, you know, We come up with all of these laws, and we take everything to the extreme. I am not creating a new kind of legalism. As a matter of fact, Jesus completely tore the guts out of that thing. He himself was accused of violating the Sabbath because his disciples were breaking the heads off grain as they walked across the field. And remember, scribes and Pharisees said, you're breaking the Sabbath. They're harvesting on the Sabbath. And Jesus basically said, the Sabbath was made for man. Wow, did you hear that? Not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. So we better figure out what the Sabbath is about because it was made for us. The Sabbath was not made for NASCAR. It was made for men. It was not made for basketball. It was made for men. It was not made for, for all of the things that eat up all of our Sabbath time. It was made for men. It was made to heal us and to help us. And it's the greatest arrogance to think that we would know better. We are surely among the most foolish and arrogant of generations for we have gutted the Sabbath, and most of us have absolutely no idea as to how we might make it holy. We have gutted the institution of marriage, ignoring its spiritual, emotional, and even anatomical design. Listen, brothers and sisters, for now and forever, before God, marriage is designed for one man to be married to one woman for life. God's design. God's design. And anything else you come up with, everything, anything else you come up with is a violation of God's design. And it is not a marriage. You say, well, gay marriage is a marriage. It can be whatever they want it to be in the eyes of the law of this land. But before God, it is not a marriage covenant. Why? Because it is not based on God's design. It's not. 
And now we as a nation are embracing the sin of homosexuality. That's what the Bible calls it. We might as well be real about it. We are embracing as a nation the sin of homosexuality, and we are drinking out of a sewer, and we're pretending that it's a spring. That's what we're doing. And we in the church, so often we look out, we look out at these people and we say, yeah, some of you may have wanted to clap, yeah, but that we've got to take a look at our own house because we've ignored Jesus' narrow guidelines on divorce. We've refused to take no as an answer from God. I want to get married. Can I marry her? No. Well, don't you want me to be happy? No. Did he die to make you happy or die to make you holy? You have to decide. Did he die to redeem you for all time or did he die just to make you smile? Is it about you or is it about him in you? You have to decide that. And with marriage, what we have done, we have, we have absolutely gutted the whole institution of marriage and we've seen everyone's happiness as being the greatest joy and the highest attainment. And so we have tried to shape God's laws to fit that. But Jesus said things that cause us to trip, so we just ignore them. And we've done what is best in our own eyes. And man, we're being called for it. We're being called on it too. Uh, the Episcopal Church has embraced, in many cases, has embraced homosexuality and homosexual marriage. And so they posted the following on their yard marker. And I'm pretty sure it was aimed at the daily pontifications of Rush Limbaugh. It's going to make you mad, but you need to see it anyways. We truly regret that gay marriage attacks the sanctity of your fourth marriage. Ouch! I didn't expect you to throw money. I knew it was going to be quiet. But see, this makes us mad. And we're ready to jump up and say, I'm, now that we need to build, there's some idea, there's some things you have to, under, we, we've got all kinds of things we want to say, but nothing, nothing burns like hypocrisy in the house of God. And we won't come to grips with the fact that we have violated sacred rhythms and we have violated what God has said is holy. And we're living with the fallout of it, and we're wondering why we can't dance. How far we are from the Scripture. We've robbed God of the tithe. We've forgotten the poor. We have demeaned the immigrant. Let those people go back to their own place, and we'll just keep on. There's nothing Christian in that, is there? Can you defend, can you defend some of this right-wing stuff you hear about closing up this? and cl How did we all get here? Weren't we all immigrants? I am an immigrant. I was born and raised in Canada, and you opened the door for me, and you showed love, and you showed mercy, which seems to be the nature of Jesus. And you say, but the economy. If you're depending on the economy, you're going down with the next burp anyways. I'm not depending on the economy. I am depending on the Lord of the harvest who has set certain principles in order that when we follow, he blesses. And there will always be room in the heart of God for more, and so our doors have to be open. You say, I'm not sure I like your political policy. I don't really care. I'm telling you what the Bible says. We have forgotten the poor. We have forgotten the immigrant. We have forgotten the orphans. We have forgotten the widows. You go to churches these days, and we got stuff going for everyone else except the big four that God's law, in Deuteronomy, God's law says, if you do this, I'll bless you. That's what I mean about we've fallen out of those sacred rhythms. Because, you see, we have evolved into Christian evolutionists, it seems. We believe that we are changing and that we're updating and we're upgrading enough so that we are no longer bound by the archaic constraints that bound Abraham and Moses and David and Isaiah. But then we find out that they also bound John and Peter and Jesus himself. We laugh about those primitive commandments, but they came from the voice of God and they established the very sacred rhythm that we have forgotten. Have we, involved, have we evolved beyond our maker? Do we think that we can abandon sacred decrees and redefine sacred altars and tune out sacred rhythms and live, live well or live at all? 
So in that first century synagogue, I sat on stones in that silent, long, dead synagogue. There was, a, there was in my heart a sudden awareness. It was a heaviness of the tragedy and the travesty of the death of the Sabbath among us and the restless nature of a church that is in an awful hurry to get absolutely nowhere. Jesus lived a Sabbath rhythm. You say, well, that was Jesus, and he came, and he rose from the dead, and we're no longer under the law. Now we're under grace, and so the synagogue and the Sabbath and all of that, we don't have to be bound to all of those things. But, but wait a minute. Twenty years after his resurrection, they were still, the Christians were still going to the synagogue on the Sabbath. They still were. Paul, the missionary Paul, when he'd go into a town, where did he go first? He went to a place where they were worshiping the one true God. He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath. He was an observant Jew. You find Paul when he goes all the way back to Jerusalem, and he's in trouble in Jerusalem, and they make accusations. And Paul says, what do you think I should do? And they say, well, you need to prove that you're devout before God and take a Nazarite vow. And so Paul does it. Because he's bound? No, because Paul has subjected himself to sacred rhythms. It was part of life. And it's only after about 100 years that the church and the synagogue get pulled apart so far from one another that we each establish our times. But at least, at least the church, and we can thank the Catholics for it, at least the church establishes a day that is set aside for worship. Now it seems that we've wanted to gut that. Jesus and the disciples on the Sabbath, they honored God on the Sabbath. They went to the synagogue and they listened to the reading of the prophets on the Sabbath and they worshiped on the Sabbath and they moved in a rhythm prescribed for us in creation. It was confirmed in the law of Moses. It's affirmed in the life of Jesus, Paul, Peter, Andrew, and all the rest. They moved in the rhythm of the synagogue and the Sabbath. They moved in a sacred rhythm. We once moved a little bit better than we do today here in America. Once we almost danced, businesses were closed on the Sabbath. You remember when you couldn't go shopping on the Sabbath? Remember? How many of you are from that generation? I know for this crew over here, they're going, no, 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 no. But you remember that generation? You couldn't buy a beer on the Sabbath because the bars were not open. Can you imagine in America that even 50 years ago you couldn't buy a beer on the Sabbath at a bar because the bars weren't open and didn't dare advocate to be open? Do you remember? When sports didn't dominate the Sabbath, but don't they? When schools didn't dominate, it used to be that the schools left the church alone on Wednesday and Thursday. They were thoughtful concerning uh, the, the amount of homework and the events that they scheduled because they wanted students to be engaged in their churches and they wouldn't touch the midweek and they certainly wouldn't touch Sunday, but now it is going full blast. I know people who don't have, they're not raising their kids in church because they've got to be traveling every week for the team to be playing somewhere else. And the Sabbath has taken second place. The day is going to come when they're going to wonder why a son or a daughter cannot hear the sacred rhythm. And I can hear your protests. You're saying, we're not under the law, we're under grace. And indeed, we are not captive to legalities, but we are collapsing in the absence of the rhythm and rest that comes only when we establish a day and a time that is God's and God's alone, a place where worship takes preeminence and resting in his hands governs. Hebrews 12, 25 makes it abundantly clear that as the coming of the Lord draws closer and closer, we are to forsake not the assembling of ourselves together, but even more so. We're supposed to be gathering together more and more and encouraging each other more and more. The trend in the culture is less and less. If all of creation flows in God-given rhythms, and indeed it does, what kind of world can we imagine where all rhythms have been replaced by the incessant beating of drums out of rhythm. What kind of world is that? I got news for you. It's a world that is governed by machines. 
machines. The most hazardous piece of real estate in all the world is the airport. It's not the runway, it's not the airlines, it's not the baggage handlers. It's the people walking down the terminal doing this. Atlanta, you take your life into your hands. I've decided that I'm going to get me one of those ninja blow-up suits, and I'm going to wear it, And because I'm just so tired. I'm just so tired of being hammered between the gates. Coffee flies and everything else. We go, oh, sorry, sorry. And, you know, and, and if it's not that, then it's the guy who's got the headset on, and he's looking at his phone while he's yelling at his headset. I just want to stop the guy at some point, pull the thing out of his ear, and slap him. But that's not a spiritual response, and that doesn't flow out of sacred rhythms. It flows out of mine, and it feels really good. But it's a world that's driven by machines where you get that type of, that kind of world that doesn't have any sacred rhythm to it. It's a world that's governed by machines. And let's face it, our lives are becoming governed by these things because it used to be you would every day, let's see, every day you would shower, in our culture anyways, right? Okay, most of us <laughs> shower, and if you're seated alone out there, you probably don't, but most of us shower, we brush our teeth three times a day, twice a day, once, once a day. Okay, there's some, you know, some students over here. Thank you. God bless you. But, um, you know, you, you've got that thing down. Do you, know you know what the most important ritual of the day is? He said, well, it's reading God's Word. I'm afraid that just isn't borne out in studies. The most important ritual of the day now is plug in your cell phone so it can get a full night's charge. Stop and think about it. What do you do every night now? You carry that precious little machine over, and you put it in its spot. It has its own spot. God doesn't get a spot in your life, but there's a place for your cell phone. It has its spot, and, oh, by the way, you charge it up. You don't charge up your spiritual life. You never open your Bible, but you've got a charger because this rules. I mean, after all, this connects you to Facebook. It connects you to Instagram. It connects you to instant messaging, and we demand. We demand access, right? Do you remember when everybody used to have a landline? Yeah, it's gone, baby. If you still got one, wonderful. I mean, it's an antique. Keep it. It may be worth something someday. Keep it. No, everybody's on, on cell phones now, and because everyone's on cell phones, we expect that they're going to answer when we call because their phone is always with them wherever they are. And when they don't answer, we get hurt. In the world of machines, we get hurt, and so we text. I know you're there. <laughs> right? Pick up. All caps. Pick up. Oh, for those of you, by the way, who are posting on Facebook and places in all caps, the whole world knows that you're just mad and they don't want to hear anything you have to say anymore because everything is just yelling. Stop it. Pick up. Pick up now. Oh, Pastor, we expect you to be accessible. What's your cell phone number? Mm. We want a response right now. How did we get there? Well, we got there in a world that's being run by machines. That's why we have 24-hour news. That's why we have Fox News. That's why we have uh, MSNBC. That's why we have CNN. All of these all-time, round-the-clocks, it's 24-7. What is it? It's a complete disruption in rhythm. It never, never stops. There's never a breather. There's never a rest. Some of you remember the, when you had to wait for the newspaper to read the news, and I know this whole crew over is going, oh, you poor people, God help you. You were raised in such, such depravity. But there was a rhythm, and the rhythm is slowly being lost in a world of machines. And would you agree with me that we are the most restless generation? Restless. You see, our hearts have stopped beating with that divine rhythm. And we think, due to the rise of machines and the instant everything culture, we think that we are now more informed and more productive and more efficient and more invested and more committed and more alive for the pace. But we are dying for the lack of a sacred rhythm and for the killing of the Sabbath and for robbing God of his day. We offer him chilled leftovers, picked over leftovers, rather than a heart of worship. And we give him a priority that is somewhere lower than charging the cell phone. 
And you see, that's what rocked me as I heard the echo of the sacred rhythm in the ruins of a synagogue just outside of Galilee. That's what rocked me. We've been robbed and we don't even know it. We have filed the Sabbath under legalism and we don't look at the file anymore. We have accepted hectic lives and 60-hour work weeks followed by active leisure and we don't take time to think and we don't take time to pray and we don't take time to meditate and we don't take time to rest. And people say, how are you doing? One, we lie and say, I'm doing great. Or two, we respond this way, oh, I'm just tired out. And today you heard someone, good possibility, you heard someone in these hallways when you came walking through, how are you doing today? I'm, I'm just tired. Well, we are because there are no sacred rhythms in our lives. And when there's no sacred rhythm, then we, we're always tired. And we're always behind and we never catch up. Take this home with you, if nothing else. Take this one thing home for you, uh, with you if, you, if you would today. Jesus, Jesus had the whole world to save and he was never once in a hurry. So what do you got to get done? Jesus had the whole world to save, all of the sins of the world, all of the burdens. Plus, he had this deluge of prayer that is offered up to the heavens where everybody is screaming for his attention. And he had all of these requests and he had all of these desires that are being launched towards him. All of this is going on. This is Jesus' work. Yet when he walked among us doing the most important work in all of the universe, you can never find a moment in all of the scripture where Jesus hurried. Never once. And see, we have fooled ourselves into thinking that our lives are a little bit more important. And if we'll just give a little bit more, and if we'll just go a little harder, and if we can just amp up the machines, well, just maybe, just maybe one of these days, we'll catch up and we'll get it all done. You know, when you walk, when you walk in a sacred rhythm, You'll find peace. You'll find rest. You'll back down. Your heart rate will return to normal. Your blood pressure will come down when you stop hurrying for everything and trust that the Lord has you in the palm of his hand and that providentially he is playing out the days of your life according to a plan that is bigger than you are and that was already in place before you even breathed your first breath. While I was in Israel, I learned things I, and became aware of things that I knew but had not really programmed into the whole equation, how they have survived through all of the years because of, one, God's plan and his grace, but also because of sacred rhythms. For the Jew, there are five mandated annual acts of worship that are required. These are the big events. Passover marks the exodus, salvation from slavery. Passover. Pentecost centers on the revelation of the law of God. It's a worship festival for the law of God being revealed to them. The ninth of Ab, a day in August on our calendars, is a fast to remember the destruction of Jerusalem and the Babylonian exile. It's to remember what they did and what God did so that they would be people who would live in harmony with his law. And so it's a big celebration, or it's a big remembrance, I should say. Then tabernacles, that provides a ritual to keep the 40 years of God's providence in the wilderness alive that they would never forget, that they blew it. And for the fact that they blew it, they had to wander around for 40 years. They have to remember that. And so they celebrate it. And then Purim, which sanctions a festival of revelry and gift-giving, a celebratory response to the fact that God saved them from genocide when they were in Persia. And they have these five festivals a year that they honor. Each of these five great acts of worship kept an essential aspect of what it meant to be a Jew alive in their minds. Have you ever wondered how the Jews have survived? And you might just say, well, they're just stubborn. Or you might back up and say, well, they're God's chosen people, and so he's protected them. And it might be yes, and it might be yes. But understand this. The Jews have survived because they have never forgotten who they are. And who they are has been printed into them in a sacred rhythm where on Friday night and into Saturday with their families, they celebrate around the table with Shabbat, and they go to the synagogue. Sherry and I were in the lobby of, the, of one of our hotels in Tiberias. And it was Saturday night, the end of their Sabbath. 
we were having a cup of coffee, and uh, we were just sitting there enjoying ourselves, and a family, a gathering came in, obviously staying in the rooms there, and they did a little setup on the table, and we didn't want to intrude, so we sat back and couldn't see all that they were doing, but they were lighting uh, some candles, and I finally asked someone, I said, tell me what's going on. They said, well, it's, and they looked outside, and the, and the sun was setting. They said, it's the end of the Sabbath, and so they're celebrating as a family the end of the Sabbath, and the coolest thing happened. As they began this, the girl who had been pulling, you know, who had been pulling our coffee shots comes out from behind that area and walks over and stands at the edge of the group with a smile all over her face. And she listens and she watches. And the girl behind the desk who had been checking people in, she comes out and she stands and I looked across and again, just this warm smile and she's looking around and these people are complete strangers to her and yet in that moment they're smiling at one another they know what's going on in the midst of of all of this and people are coming through the door and they see what's going on and they come over and they stand and the the manager of the hotel who was charged with making sure that I was happy because I had brought a tour group that's a big thing and so they were treating me like a king she comes over she looks at me she smiles for a moment walks right over to the group and stands on the edge of the group as they're finishing up the Sabbath and the, the youngest are there and the oldest are there. And I sat back and I thought, we have completely blown it out of its traces. We have completely destroyed this whole idea that the Sabbath is about family together imprinting in family members that we are the children of God and that our identity has to be renewed over and over and over and over again. How many of you are struggling right now to get one meal a week together with your family? How many of you are struggling to get anything spiritual happening in that one meal a week? How many of you have never even thought of the concept? Because our culture is moving faster and faster and faster, and we are ignoring the sacred rhythms. And if you want to know why the Jews have survived when they have, been, when they have been attacked and almost extinguished time and time again in history, it's because they always understood and they always preserved their identity before God. By what? By their sacred rhythms. We've held to Christmas and Easter. And we've succeeded in making them the busiest seasons of the year, things we've got to get through. I don't know if I've got the gravitas yet to do it here at Calvary. I don't think I do. I'm 30 years. That's something, but it's not enough because I would like to cancel Christmas. All of it except for drawing people together with their family, everyone, everyone at this one time, this one, everyone come together, and the key is we're all going to come together, we're going to celebrate the best gift that was ever given, and we're going to give gifts to complete strangers all over the place randomly. And I think it might just be a lot more pleasing to the Lord than the madness we engage in. In the busiest season of the year, where we drive ourselves into the ground to make sure we can hit all of the parties and make sure that we get all of the gifts and make sure that everybody's happy and make sure that everybody can gather around the table so they can get mad at each other until Thanksgiving. Right? Madness. It'd be good just to cancel it for what we've made of it. Not that we should cancel it altogether because we need to, some point in the year we need to say, we need to recognize these important issues so that we at least recognize them once a year, but it should be so much more than that. We ought to do Christmas in July some year. How many of you think I've got a chance of selling any of this stuff? It's about what I thought. Thank you for your support. Rolling on. This is why I stay out of politics, by the way. We have Christmas and Easter, and we've succeeded in making them busy. We've got a two-stroke engine and a sputtering Sabbath. And you have to ask yourself, can we survive it? Can we keep going this way? You see, the Sabbath is in need of salvation. The Sabbath needs to get saved. It has fallen from its greatness. It has lost its genius. And about this time, 
about this time, you are expecting, I would think you are expecting me to make some demand of you or make some proposal to you that I lay down the law and tell you what makes a good churchman good and a bad churchman bad. About this time, you might be ready for a suggestion on how we might fix it, some quick fix, if you please. About this time, you might expect a program to be launched or a campaign to be promoted to bring back the Sabbath, but I'm not going to waste my time or your time or my breath because if you don't feel it and if you can't hear it this morning, it'll mean nothing anyways. But I think people hear it. I think there are people here who deep in their heart hear the amen that says, I need that cycle in my life, that Sabbath in my life, that rest in my life, that I'm not going to hurry in my life, that worship in my life. I need that on an ongoing basis. It must be regular. I need something that identifies me even deeper with who I am as a Christian. I need to celebrate it with all my heart. And only you can do that. You might expect that I've got a five-point plan, but I don't, except that you grapple with the need for Christ's lordship over your calendar, over your marriage, over your wallet, over your children, over your occupation, and especially over your worship. And if you don't feel it and you don't hear it, if you don't hear it like I heard it in that synagogue in our belt, Nothing I can say will make you hear it at all. Jesus regularly broke away from the disciples and he climbed up in the hills to pray. Jesus never missed a Sabbath in the synagogue to our knowledge. Jesus refused to be hurried and rushed when it came to the priorities of his Father's will. Jesus did not waste his energies or his time building earthly kingdoms or trying to influence political ones. He moved in the rhythm of worship, the word, the feasts, prayer, relationship. And all of us who do will do well and will learn to dance because the universe we've been placed in, all of it pulsates with rhythm. Have you established a rhythm? Have you established a worship rhythm? In your, for Sherry and I, our Sabbath is Fridays. We get up on Fridays. We don't go to the church on Fridays. We don't work on Fridays. I don't do sermon work on Fridays, except those few times I've violated my Fridays. But I try not to because that's our Sabbath. We don't get up on Friday and say, today we're going to do this, 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 and this. We want a day that's clean. We want a day that's clear. We want a day that's empty. And it's okay at the end of the day if we look at each other and say, you know, we did absolutely nothing today. Because you keep stuffing your life full and your life is ultimately going to crush you. You need the time to breathe. You say, well, I, what do you do, Pastor? Well, you learn to think and you learn to meditate and you learn to, to welcome his word and you learn to love your family. And you look for some place where you can give a little bit and you invite God into the moment and everything that you do. It doesn't mean that you live by some kind of cold legalism that says, well, I can't, I just have to stand here or sit here or kneel here for the whole Sabbath because that's the Sabbath. No. It means that you bring God into a day that is His and His alone. You choose within the context of worship and services that are provided for you which should really, in their truth, be services we give to God. But Sundays are crazy for us, so Fridays. There's a rhythm in our life with Friday. Do you hear the music, or is it noise? Do you feel the rhythm, or is it just a pounding? Everything God created is pointing away. So you say, what are you advocating, Pastor? I'm advocating that you look inside because I can't speak to your life. That you look inside and say, God, speak to me about arranging my life in such a way 
that I begin to move in the sacred rhythms that you have set in place. Amen. And if that's your desire, why don't you just stand with me this morning? Matt Redmond's a great worship leader, an incredible songwriter. Early in his ministry years, he got so wrapped up in everything that was going on and trying to make church happen on Sundays that he realized that his soul was dying. His soul was dying. He was in a mega church and he was the guy. He was the worship guy and he was responsible for everything that took place. And he had the band and everything, he had all of the stuff that goes in to make it happen. And it's huge. And so Redmond got to a point where he couldn't really figure out why his life was withering on the vine. And all of a sudden he realized that worship for him had become the show. Worship for him had been making sure that everybody was tuned up and everybody was playing in key and making sure that everybody knew their songs and everybody hit their marks and making sure that it was musical excellence and that everybody was, everybody was turned on and making sure that the congregation was on the edge of their seats or standing on the balls of their feet, waving their hands. And it broke him. It crushed him. And he sat down and he began to write. And Armando, could we go to the verse when the music fades? Let's go to the verse, yeah. This is what he wrote. Some of you know He it. must lie at the center of the rhythm of life, or life simply will not dance. And only you can place him there. And if God's speaking to your heart about that placement right now, saying something's got to die in me so he can live in me, something has to be laid down so I can rise up, something has to stop so I can go on, if that's you, why don't you come and just kneel? Just kneel before the Lord. We have altars here for that purpose. Just kneel and say, Lord, you know. You know what needs to go. You know what I need to lay down. Here it is, Lord. Why don't you choose? to listen for the rhythm and to listen for his voice because he's going to speak to you like he did to me in that synagogue. He's going to speak to you. He's going to meet you. At this point in time, our general service is dismissed. So you don't need another song or a goodbye or a prayer or anything. This service is dismissed. But this place is a place where we can kneel before him. And if God is speaking to your heart, we welcome you to join us here. May God richly bless your life as you walk with him. Find the rhythm. Find the beat. God bless you.